Hello world and welcome. I'm Carter the Great Bear of the North, and this is Europe Universalis for all the DLC up to and including Mari Nostrum, the 1.25 Rural Britannia patch, and a bunch of mods which you can see in the description box below. In this particular run through, we will be playing as Venice, and if you've been following my channel, or especially my other Let's Play series on Universe Europe Universalis, you know I like to incorporate a little bit of history. So without further ado, here's how Venice went from a marshy lagoon to the eastern Mediterranean power that it is in November 1444. Modern-day Venice is iconic, from handmade gondolas gliding on the Grand Canal to flooding in Piazza San Marco, the Bridge of Sighs to the Rialto Bridge, the Basilica San Marco Carnival masks, Venice seems destined to be featured on a postcard, and its citizens are famous for their passion. Casanova's sensuality, Titian's devoted colors, Vivaldi's movement, and the wanderlust of Marco Polo and Giovanni Caboto. But our romantic image of Venice is a decidedly recent one, the result of more than a millennium of self-government combined with all the pleasures of the modern world. At the beginning of Europa Universalis, in November 1444, Venice was at the height of its power under Doge Francesco Foscari, with territory stretching from the snow-capped Alps to the wine dark Aegean. The Doge, elected for life by the people of Venice in a highly convoluted and complicated process, guided the most serene republic from the very comfortable confines of the Palazzo Ducale, overlooking both the Piazza San Marco and the Upper Adriatic. But the republic's origins are far from romantic, auspicious, or comfortable. Initially, the area around the shallow marshy Laguna Veneto was settled by citizens of the declining Eastern Roman Empire fleeing invasions from the Longobards in the late 6th century. From the very beginning, these refugees would be caught between worlds, land and sea, east and west, holy and eastern Roman empires, orthodox and Latin Christianity. The Venetians used this liminality to their advantage, acting as liaisons and traders between empires. As their wealth grew, so did their power, eventually earning recognition of their de facto independence from both the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne and Byzantine Emperor Nicephoros in 803, and gained highly advantageous trade deals with both major powers, furthering their own power and influence. Despite their mercantile wealth, the Venetians did not initially have ambitions of expansion. Rather, their territorial gains were designed to protect their trade goals. At the end of the first millennium CE, the northeastern Adriatic with its rough, rocky coasts was a haven for pirates. For centuries, these pirates harassed all merchants in the area, Venetians included. In 988, the citizens of Zara, a major fishing and trading port in the eastern Adriatic, an erstwhile rival to Venice, sought the most serene republic's assistance against these pirates. Doge Pietro Orseolo sensed the opportunity, and after assembling a powerful fleet set sail from the lagoon. He and his navy traveled to all the major cities in Istria and Dalmatia, offering protection from the raiders. Many cities swore oaths of loyalty to the Republic, though in practice it was more akin to tribute than formal incorporation. The pirates that resisted were soundly defeated and scattered, never to return. The Venetians stuck around to defend their interests, and the Stato da Mar, Venice's overseas territories, was born. As Venice's power and trading rights with the Germans, the Byzantines, and the Papacy grew, so too did jealousy and envy, culminating in the Massacre of the Latins, an anti-Catholic riot in April 1182 in Constantinople. Just a short time later, Pope Innocent III was struggling to build interest in a crusade to regain the lands of Jerusalem from Muslim control. Intending to attack the Holy Land via Egypt, Innocent knew that a mighty fleet was needed to transport an anticipated 35,000 troops across the Mediterranean and turned to the Venetians, often enthusiastic crusaders, for assistance. The Venetians agreed to help and set to work expanding their fleet. By the scheduled time of departure in 1202, only 12,000 men had assembled in Venice and did not have nearly enough money to pay their debt to the Venetians. The blind doge Enrico D'Angelo agreed to support the crusade anyways, so long as the crusaders agreed to make a stop in Zara first, which by this time had grown to become a major thorn in San Marco's paw. Despite Pope Innocent forbidding the attack, the crusaders sacked Zara, resulting in the Venetians' excommunication for attacking a fellow Christian city. I'm not entirely sure how excommunicating the owners of your crusade's transportation is considered a good idea, but what are you going to do? Meanwhile, Alexios Angelos, the exiled Byzantine emperor who was with the crusaders in Zara, sought an alliance to regain his imperial crown. With the promise of an additional 10,000 men and 200,000 ducats, more than twice the value of the original crusade contract, Alexios convinced Dandolo and the crusaders to make another detour, this time to the city of the world's desire, Constantinople. No doubt the idea of revenge for the massacre of the Latins just 20 years prior motivated the Venetians too. The crusaders attacked, sieged, and took Constantinople, restoring Alexios, now Alexios IV, to the throne. 
He soon found his imperial treasury to be empty, however, and refused to pay the crusaders their due. Angered at twice being denied their pay, the Venetians attacked the city again, sieged it again, and sacked it again. Among their more famous acquisitions from this crusade are the four bronze horses of St. Mark now on display in the Basilica San Marco in Venice proper. In the eventual peace treaty, the Most Serene Republic also acquired the territories of Crete, Euboea, Naxos, Corfu, Durazzo, and Adrianopolis, dramatically expanding the Statue de Mar. Though longtime mercantile rivals, Venice and Genoa's animosity came to a head as a result of the gains from the Fourth Crusade. Starting in the 1250s, Venice engaged in more than a century of on-again, off-again war for control of Mediterranean trade with the Genoese. During this conflict, the Venetian Marco Polo left for Cathay, returned 15 years later, and even wrote a memoir of his travels while in a Genoese prison. It wasn't until 1381 and the Peace of Turin that the Genoese, their naval supremacy shattered, and finally accepted Venetian hegemony in the Adriatic. Similarly, Venice feared the ability of the Veronese, under the leadership of the Della Scala family, to disrupt their inland trade routes up the Po Valley. To protect their interests, the Republic managed to secure first Mestre just across the lagoon, and then Treviso further upriver from the Della Scala control in the 1330s. Not surprisingly, this upset the Veronese, who, like the Genoese before them, fought the Venetians for many decades before eventually accepting peace in 1404, that transferred control of Vicenza, Verona, Padua, and Este to the Venetians. Meanwhile, King Louis I of Hungary coveted access to the Adriatic, and convinced Padua, the Patriarchate of Aquileia, and the Holy Roman Empire Louis' cousin into a league against Venice, causing the Republic to lose control of its Dalmatian holdings in 1358. Venice remained patient, however, and took advantage of the opportunities that presented themselves, usually by buying their way into more territory and power. In 1396, the House of Balsic, lords of much of modern-day Montenegro and northern Albania, sold the right to Scutari, Budva, Bar, and the surrounding lands to, to the Venetians, rather than see them fall into Ottoman hands. Regional nobles were of course upset at this perceived betrayal, and waged war against the Republic until 1423 when they too finally accepted Venetian control. While embroiled in a long, losing succession war with Hungary, Ladislav of Naples desperately needed funds to turn the tide. He sold his Dalmatian territories to Venice in 1409 for 100,000 ducats, giving the Republic control of the eastern Adriatic from Zara to Dorazzo, with the exception of Dubrovnik. And in 1411, the Patriarchate of Aquileia was embroiled in near civil war. Backing the faction in Udine, the capital of the region, Venice defeated the imperial forces and captured the region in 1420, expanding the terra firma and giving Venice near complete control over the northern Adriatic. And finally, in 1426, Filippo Maria Visconti, the Duke of Milan, regained control of Brescia from the Condottiero Pandolfo Malatesta, and then immediately sold it to Venice. Again, the local nobility were upset, and forced the Visconti to try and reclaim the city from the Republic. In return, Venice hired mercenary Captain Francesco Sforza, former leader of the Milanese army against the papacy and noted turncoat, to recapture the city that they had just bought from Milan. Less than five years later, Sforza would again switch allegiances, agreeing to work for Visconti, eventually succeeding him as Duke of Milan and starting his own dynasty in the region. And that brings us to November 1444, Francesco Foscari and Europa Universalis IV. Enjoy. All right, with the boring learning out of the way, let's get into the game, shall we? First off is what I want to do is, before I forget, I want to make my trade guy go from Venice up from Vienna all the way down to Constantinople, transfer trade power. There we go. I also want to start a trade league and invite Ragusa into it because that will have transferred their trade power. And they are actually a trade power in and of themselves. They have uh, a wonderful little coastal center of trade. So if they are in our trade league, that means they can't start their own, which is very, very good for us. Good. They joined us, and that's amazing. Oh, right. Rivals. I want our rivals to be the Eastern Roman Empire. I want our rivals to also be Hungary, which if you watch the educational portion of this program, you know exactly why we want to deal with Hungary. And I'm also going to do, uh, make a rival with um, the Turks or Aragon. Let's get the Turks. That way people will be more likely to, um, the Ottomans rather. That way people will be more likely to aid us against them, such as specifically France. Boom. One more day. Castile. Boom. Fantastic. What I also want to do is want to revoke our guarantees on Albania and Rhodes. Because right now we are over our diplomatic relations limit. 
And so we're losing a little bit of, of diplomatic power every, every month. So I want to actually invite them to our trade league, which means that on a defensive side, we can still protect them, but we don't use a diplomatic relations slot for that. Fantastic. Good. I also want to start building up a, a, a spy network in the Eastern Roman Empire so we can lay claim to their territory and prevent it from falling into the hands of the Ottomans, which is the only reason why we want their territory, of course. We don't want it for our particular trading ends. No, 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 no. That's that's selfish. This is we're, we're the Venetian Republic. We're not selfish. We're act, we're looking out for their best interests. We're also going to have to build up a little bit of a military in order to make that happen. Right. We also want to start protecting trade in oh in Constantinople. Brilliant. And these guys we will actually start to build how many extra galleys can we build we can build six more but we only have enough money for one so it's actually drop down our army maintenance let's also cut back our fort maintenance turn the doge into a leader and then we will uh re-up our maintenance just before we go to war with the eastern roman empire Okay, we still have one more um, diploma, diplomat left. We can't revoke the guarantee. That has to be next month, right? So who do you want to invite into our trade league? We want to invite Mantua, just to protect them against, say, Milanese uh, expansion. We also want to invite Siena. Ooh, ooh, and I, I often forget to do this. Can we invite... No! We cannot invite mains into our trade league because we're our trade league is already too big for them. All right, so let's invite Lucha into our trade league to, prevent, to keep them out of the hands of the Genoese. Fantastic. Good. This is actually looking pretty good. Let's get a an alliance with the Pope. If only to make the uh, papal interactions, such as levy church taxes, sanction commercial monopolies, send papal legates, um... If only to make those a little bit more frequent, easier, more prosperous, things like that. Um, so yeah, all very, very good reasons to um, to be friends with the Pope. Right? And also, they actually have a pretty powerful army, just based on this. Oh, right, Cyprus. I forgot to invite Cyprus. That was on my list of things to do. Uh, and Death Martian. Whatever. Don't really care about Death Martian. Or Ulm, for that matter. Or Hormoz. Personally, I quite dislike Hormoz. One, two, there we go. And I really realized I was on two that entire time. We could have gone a lot faster. Navarre has gone into the trade league. And yeah, and if you guys may have noticed, um, one of my, the mods that I use is the Toponymic Names mod, which renames the countries based on what they would have called themselves. Because I teach history, I think... Um, if we do it this way, it's a little bit of respect just for who they were and things like that. So I try to be um, just a little bit historically accurate. Um, I always, however, fail to remember that it's not the Byzantine Rome. It's not the Byzantine Empire. It's the Eastern Roman Empire um, or just the Roman Empire, as they would have called themselves. Just because that's that's it's so ingrained in my mind to call them the Byzantines, even though that was uh, a term I believe created by Frenchmen many centuries after the actual historical fact. But uh, it is what it is, I guess. Let's get some more galleys. There we go. One more. Good. That will just make um, any potential conflict with well, not potential conflict. We're definitely going to get into a conflict with the Eastern Romans, but. Um, it makes the eventual conflict a little bit easier for us to to handle if we have a um, if we have a better navy. To be perfectly honest, we are fourteen point seven seven. Oh right, right. Oh, I forgot to do this. <sighs> Revoke the guarantees on Albania and Rhodes. Revoke the guarantee. There we go. Man, like as you can see, I don't. I'm not trying to make this the perfect run through. I'm not flurry. I'm not, you know, ridiculously good at this game. I just 
like playing it. So hopefully you guys will enjoy watching me play it as well. So let's bring our navy over. Oh, right. Also, before I forget, it's kind of important. Really, that's the admiral we're going to get? No. There we go. And the other admiral will be kicked to the, to the curb. There we go. Good. This is pretty good. Okay, so we actually do already have our claim um, on the Byzantine. On uh, the Byzantine. See, there we go. There we go. Um, on the Eastern Romans. Let's see. How is Naples? Support independence. What is there? That's 31.7. All right. Um, diplomatic insult against Ferrara. There we go. Let's get our other fleet right in there. Good. They're all defending the Aegean. All right. Also increase the army maintenance. That will make our guys not get their butts kicked. Uh, the Eastern Romans have called Negropont their own. No, 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 boys. No, 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 no. In fact, I will raise you. I will see your claim, and I will raise you one. Uh, nope, I want Athens, actually. Um, no, you know what? Because Athens will be involved in this war anyways. Let's actually declare war. Uh, let's call it yeah, Achaia. Because technically, at this time, uh, the Venetians have uh, Modon and Coron, Cordron, Cordron, uh, two little cities down here in Achaia. So no, we, we, we can make some claims that we should have uh, more territory from the um, partition of the Eastern Roman Empire in 1204. Let's also get this guy down here, and then we will declare the war very, very shortly, just because our men are not at full morale, and it would be silly to make that mistake. It would be really silly. To there we go. And Athens has actually attempted to do uh, claim Negropont as their own, so that's not going to happen. Boom. Here we go, here we go, here we go again. Smacking the Athenian. I don't know why I do that, but I do every so often. Um, and it's terrible each and every time. Each and every time. Let's... No, no, we don't want to... Actually, yeah, you know, let's take our four galleys. Let's send them down through here. Okay. I was going to say they can clean up that one ga that one other galley, the one Athenian galley by themselves, but it appears they don't need to because it was already taken out by Corfu, which is good. And yes, we will eventually incorporate Corfu into Corfu and Naxos into our... Um, what? Why didn't that happen? Oh, because I hit select, not merge. There we go. Uh, bourgeoisie request privileges. The bourgeoisie class has grown increasingly resentful of the power of the noble families, in particular their lack of opportunities in the higher ranks of government. That's because in the Venetian government there was something called the Serata, which even though Venice was a republic, only certain people, certain noble families, could enjoy the benefits of serving in the city government. Their only route into power is to marry into poor but well-titled noble families or pry open positions in government circles. We can grant them privileges, or we can deny them privileges. Either way, we will lose some kinds of power. Let's lose some diplomatic power. It will deny them the privileges. We will maintain the serata, the closing. It's actually a giant book um, called The Golden Book that uh, was a list of all the different Venetian families that were able to serve in government. Kind of cool. The Venetians were amazingly... Um, Obsessive, I'll call them, uh, record keepers. So we know actually quite a lot about the the intricacies of their government and what people were thinking, and even you know their their ledgers of of bills outstanding and whatever. Really cool, really fascinating stuff. That wild rumors are circulating about our nobility plotting with foreign powers. Hysteria grows and the mood is fearful. The people demand that we strike at the traitors, but wiser minds say that we must let tradition of republican justice take its course. Justice above all, we could lose one stability. No. Not going to happen. Or we can lose a little bit of Republican tradition, which is fine because I want to switch to a monarchy. Anyways, we can gain 80 ducats while we're at it. Yeah, let's do that. Let's definitely do that. Good. We have taken Morea. And we also want to take... Oh, trade between rivals. We are open to business with everyone, as long as we can control it. 
What business we can and cannot control is open to debate, and as most question, as most question, and as most questions open to debate in our republic, it has become subject to it. And as most question, nah, that sentence isn't written properly. Merton's have started trading on friendly terms with one of our rivals, claiming it's necessary despite political disagreements. Aristocrats find this questionable and call for an immediate end to the exchange. The aristocrats, traders, I don't want to lose ducats and military powder, power, or Hungary can gain power in one of the nodes we trade in, but we'll also gain diplomatic power. Yeah, let's do that. Anything that the traders have gained a dominant position in our country, one of the three factions, tax modifier goes down, but trade power and naval maintenance uh, both swing in our favor. Okay, good. Good. We have smashed, smashed their fleet. Okay, now who do I want? 1120 or 1012. We're going to invade with Francesco Fascari, the Doge, and then we will supplant that uh, very shortly thereafter with our other 10,000 men, just to hopefully avoid a... Oh, crap. Okay. Um, there's an election, because Francesco Foscari has died. So we're actually going to take this army back to the island of Ubayo. We're going to get a bureaucrat candidate. The guilds will gain a little bit of influence, but that is okay. And the reason we want the, bu the, the bureaucracy is because that will get us to national ideas faster, and it will also get us to... Um, it'll make it really easy for us to take over a lot of the clay. And this guy's a fantastic... Leader, if we'd already developed rifles and muskets and whatever, but we haven't, so he's kind of... Oh, boy. Anyways, let's let him go back and invade again. And then shortly thereafter, they will follow up with the other 10,000 men. Hungary is called, claimed to Dalmatia as their own. It's not the first time. It won't be the last. Come on. There we go. And hopefully we can win this one. We should have this. There we go. Good. It's only a matter of time before Constantinople, the city of world's desire, will fall for the Venetian Republic for the second time in 250 years. Actually, third time. But who's counting? Venice should control trade in the entirety of the Adriatic. This is our mission, which puts us into conflict with the upstart city of Ragusa, also known as Dubrovnik. But... We've already smashed that around because we made that trade league with Ragusa. They transfer their trade power to us. It's beautiful. You've completed the mission monopolize Adriatic trade. We now have two mercant mercantilism, 100 diplomatic power, and we have a permanent claim on Cyprus. However, Cyprus is currently... Their independence is guaranteed by the Mamluks. Which, once we develop our navy a little bit, maybe smash the Ottomans, isn't too hard to, to defeat. Um... Especially when we're talking about a naval war. And also if the Eastern Roman Empire is on our side as well, that's not too shabby. But for now, we can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Because just for the sake of comparison... Actually, hey, we might be able to. We have 10 galleys and 11 transports. They have 8 galleys and 11 transports. And we also have more light ships. We might be able to take them out. But, yeah, here's the thing. Yeah, they have 29,000 men. They have a lot more men than we do. So, so yeah. Actually, what is our naval force limit? Our naval force limit is 28. We're at 28. We're almost at our land force limit as well. <sighs> no. That's not how that's going to work. What I want is... I want you... Both... To be my vassals. No, I don't want you both to be my vassals. Because then I'm just going to have to... Um, spend even more diplomatic power. What I want is this. I want Athens to be my va to to come directly to me, and uh, the rest of the Romans to be my vassals. And then I want you to give me a bunch of money. But it's going to take a while because we haven't even taken their capital, Constantinople, Constantinopoli, Constantinopolis, rather. If you want to be all Eastern Roman about it. But yeah, this is good. Oh, 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 it occurs to me. It occurs to me. We can probably start fabricating claims on Naples. Boom. There we go. Whew. 
Good. Which means once we do get enough military favors from France and Castile, and possibly even the papacy, it'll be really easy to take over large chunks of Naples all at once. And that's the plan. That is definitely the plan. Come on. Oh, fantastic. There we go. Just gonna wait for this naval battle to finish, see if we can't take any of their boats. We did not. But, come on. Uh, let's drop down that a little bit more, 100%. I just want to double check. Athens will be ceded to Venice. Nice. The Romans will become a vassal of Venice, as opposed to the other way around. And everything, they'll pay me money, everything is good. Love it. Boom. Fantastic. Excellent. And before I forget, let us also immediately send a... Oh no, we can't. We have to wait a little bit. But we need a new rival. So now our rival will be... Milan, Aragon... Let's call it... Let's say Aragon. There we go. Love it. And we do want to eventually send a diplomat to... The Romans, just to make them a little bit less hostile. We can probably stop building our spy network. There we go. Oh, oh, also, let's start building up our relations with Naxos and, and Corfu in order to eventually integrate them further into our empire, into our republic. Oops, did I say empire? No, 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 we don't have an empire. Actually, Corfu can wait a little bit, because I want to make the Romans a little bit friendlier with us. Fantastic. And now, again, before I forget, let's fabricate another claim on Bari. No, Capitanata. There we go. Fantastic. So there we go. I think that is good for... Oh, 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 oh. Also, before I forget, protect trade. Venice, point one. Let's just see which one will give me the highest profit. Constantinople or Alexandria. Let's say Constantinople. There we go. It's, it's not Istanbul, it's Constantinople. Eh? But for now, thank you very much for watching. If you like what we see, please like, please subscribe, please comment, follow me on Twitch, follow me on Twitter. Learn the history of the games that you play. And most importantly, have a fantastic day, everybody. And I'll see you all next time in the most serene republic.